We've come to the end of the quarter. God's mission, my mission in our Sabbath school lessons. And lesson number 13 is titled, The End of God's Mission. Our memory verse, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Here is an appeal by Peter to live godly lives in the light of the second coming of Christ. The lesson begins with a discussion of the book of Revelation, and it gives it really a kind of a new twist, a different twist. Most of the time we think of Revelation, we think of the revelation of divine truth, Jesus, the center of Revelation, revealing his last day truth to mankind. That's certainly true. But this is looking at it from the standpoint of mission. And when you look at it through the eyes of mission, it really opens up new vistas of understanding and new horizons of understanding. In the lesson for Sabbath afternoon, the first paragraph says, the book of Revelation fills the mind with scenes of the end. The epicenter of the book deals with the cosmic conflict between Christ and Satan. Satan has lost his legal hold over the earth, and now he pursues those who remain loyal to God. The book climaxes with Jesus' return to deliver his children, both the living righteous and those faithful ones who've died since the fall of Adam and Eve. The book shows us the destruction of Satan and Jesus' establishment of his eternal kingdom. So what, what is this talking about when it says Satan has lost his legal hold over the earth? When Adam and Eve sinned, they lost their right to have dominion over the earth. Remember, when Adam and Eve were created, God said, I'll give you dominion. They lost that right to have dominion. Satan became the prince of this world. Remember, when Jesus was tempted, he said, the prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. That is, there was nothing within Jesus for Satan to gain a foothold of temptations, but Satan was the prince of the world. Ephesians 2 verse 2 says Satan's the prince of the power of the air. So Adam and Eve sin, they lose their legal right to have dominion. Satan then has legal control of the world. When Jesus dies on the cross, you remember scripture says, I saw Satan like lightning fall from heaven. There's more than one fall of Satan. When the battle between good and evil took place in Revelation 12, verse 7 to 9, uh, Satan was cast out of heaven, but he could go to the gates of heaven according to Job chapter 1. When Christ died on the cross, Satan was limited to the atmosphere around the earth. During the millennial period, Satan will walk up and down upon the earth and not even have access to the atmosphere. But when Christ dies on the cross, Satan loses his legal hold and Jesus becomes the rightful ruler of this world. His kingdom will be restored uh, when he comes again, but he is the rightful ruler of the world. Now, the book of Revelation points out that you and I are to be witnesses for, to Christ and to, and to be powerful ambassadors for Jesus, declaring that Christ is victor over Satan, declaring that Jesus is Lord, declaring that Christ's kingdom has triumphed and will triumph. Now, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 to 7, I want you to look at those verses with new eyes, the eyes of mission, the eyes of soul winning, the eyes of evangelism, the eyes of witness. Revelation 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this is not simply a revelation of beasts and mysterious images, although it is that, and they're important, but it's a revelation of Jesus, which is the most important, which God gave to him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God in the testimony of Jesus Christ. So God has a message for mankind. He gives it to Jesus. Jesus sends an angel to earth. The angel blesses the mind of John. And I want you to get these words. What does it say? Who bore witness of the word of God. Did John store up these things in his own mind and heart? Not at all. He bore witness of the word of God. And he bore witness of the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John shared what he knew. You can look at Sunday's lesson 
and uh, we point out that John bears witness to the word of God, and we point out, too, that uh, the key words there are witness and testimony. And then you remember the Bible says that he sent it to the seven churches. So Revelation was a letter sent to these seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. They were kind of on a postal route. And so the book of Revelation traveled that postal route as a witness to Jesus in his triumph over the principalities and powers of hell and his eventual triumph over Satan. So the book of Revelation comes directly from God through Jesus, through the angel, as a witness. As a witness. It's a missionary book. Now in Revelation 1 verse 6, it says that God's people who come to Christ, who are redeemed by the blood of Christ, become kings and priests to God. I love the note under this one. It says, the redeemed become royalty or kings because we are blood related to the king of the universe through Jesus shed blood. Now as royal family members, we join the mission of the royal family and the salvation of other human beings. This makes us priests. Christ had constituted his church a kingdom and its individual members priests to be of the kingdom is to be a priest. In other words, we are priests, kings and priests to God. We have royal blood running through our veins. We've been redeemed by the grace of Christ. We're elevated to royalty. We're taken from our, as one of my friends put it, from the guttermost to the uttermost, from the depths of despair to the delights of discipleship. We're taken from where we are and symbolically we sit on the throne with Jesus by faith. We have royal robes by faith. We have the crown of glory by faith, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. Not because of our righteousness, but because of his righteousness. Not because of our goodness, but because of his goodness. And here we find an urgency. Why? Must we, as kings, be priests, representatives of the Christ? Now, because in Revelation 1-7 it says, Behold, he comes with clouds and every eye will see him. Living on the knife edge of eternity, living just before the coming of Christ, we become priests of God. In the book of Revelation, God has given us the three angels' messages. These three angels' messages... In Revelation 14, verse 6 to 12, reveal the final conflict between good and evil. In Revelation 14, it's divided into three parts. Verse 1 to 5 are a people called the 144,000 that stand on the sea of glass, that stand before God's throne. Who are these? They are the redeemed, caught up alive from earth. Is the 144,000 an exact number? Not necessarily, because it says 12,000 from each of the tribes. The tribes of Israel today are indistinct. Are, are, you can't distinguish them. They're indistinguishable. Why? Because of the many years, thousands of years of intermarriage of those tribes. So you don't have the tribe of Judah, Naphtali, etc., Dan, set uh, clearly today. So it can't be 12,000 be tribes. Then it would be rather strange, 12,000 from each tribe. Um, what does that mean? How would you have that exact number of the saved? So the 144,000 is a character distinction, character qualification of men and women. The Bible says they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They are totally committed to Christ. They're virgins, not literal virgins, just like 144,000 is not a literal number. Uh, they're virgins. What does it mean? They're espoused to, one, espoused to one lover, Jesus Christ. So you have Revelation 14, verse 1 to five, describing this group of people that are totally sold out for Christ, this group of people that don't compromise their integrity, this group of people that stand where the world bows down. Then in chapters 14, 6 through 12, you have the message that prepares them to stand. And then in verses 13 to 20, you have the event for which they're pre prepared, the harvest or the second coming of Christ. So you have a people redeemed, the message that prepares them for that redemption and the event for which they are prepared. So what is this three angels message anyway? 
The first angel's message says, I saw another angel flying in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So here is a message to go to the ends of the earth. Here is a mission that's larger than we are, to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It's to leap across geographical boundaries. It's to span oceans. It's to penetrate the impenetrable areas. It's to go where there are no believers. It's to enter large cities. It's to enter into closed, remote countries. It is the everlasting gospel that's to be preached to all the world. It's a mission about obedience, fearing God. It's a message about our lifestyle, giving glory to God. It's a message about the the judgment uh, hour, uh, the coming of Christ. And it's a message about worshiping the Creator on the Bible Sabbath. Um, Here in Revelation 14, we have God's last day message, and we have this tremendous appeal, appeal to be faithful to God. It reminds me of Luke chapter 11 and verse 23. Luke 11, verse 23. Remember in Jesus' day, he made a very strong appeal as well. Luke 11, verse 23. Notice the appeal here that Jesus talks about. He says, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. So in other words, the three angels' messages draws a people to be with Christ. It draws them to be faithful to Christ. What is the essence of this message? It's the everlasting gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ has redeemed us, the good news that our sins can be forgiven, the good news that our life can be changed. What is the three angels' message? In the context of the gospel and the good news, the three angels' message calls us to obedience, fear God. The Greek word for fear is phoebo, which means take God seriously. Remember in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 14, it says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So this idea of fearing God is to take God seriously and decide to be obedient to him in your mind. Fear God and give glory to him, verse 7, Revelation 14. What does it mean to give glory to him? Well, the Bible tells us, whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So give glory to God in your lifestyle is what you're looking at on television, the internet, giving glory to God, is what you're hearing in music, giving glory to God. Are are the place your feet are taking you, does that give you glory to God? In your mind, are your thought patterns throughout the day, does that give glory to God? Why is it important to take God seriously and obey Him and give Him glory? Because the hour of His judgment has come. We're not living in a common time. We're not living in an ordinary time. We're living in a special time just before the coming of Jesus. And because of that, there's a call in the age of evolution to worship him who made heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. Worship who? The creator. So here's a call to worship the creator on the seventh day of the week, the Bible Sabbath. And the majority in our world have have rejected that idea. So that's why Babylon, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. What does Babylon represent? Confusion, false religion. And those who accept that false religion will ultimately one day receive the mark of the beast. And in contrast to that, we have Revelation 14 and verse 12. You'll find it there. This is in contrast to those who receive the mark of the beast. One group worships the creator. The next group worships the beast. And here in Revelation 14, verse 12, we read, it says, here are the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So, Revelation 14, 7, worship the Creator. Revelation 14, 9, don't worship the beast. Revelation 14, 12, in contradistinction to those that worship the beast are those who worship the Creator. And what do they do? They keep the commandments of God. And one of those commandments is remember the Sabbath. So we find that there, this great mighty appeal. Now, God, Tuesday's lesson, God is leading all humanity in His love we, ha- we are listed four Bible texts there, 1 John 4, 8, 2 Peter 3, 9, 1 Peter 2, 4, Genesis 12, 3. What do these texts say? What's the essential theme of them? Well, 1 John 4, 8 is God is love. 2 Peter 3, verse 9 says that God's not willing to have any perish. 1 Timothy 2, 4 says he wants all men to come to salvation. 
And Genesis 12, verse 3 tells the story of Abraham and that through Abraham all nations would be blessed. So God is a missionary God in the light of the conflict between good and evil, in the light of the controversy between good and evil, in the light of earth's final hour, God is appealing to men and women to be saved in his kingdom. Now, there are those who refuse his salvation. That leads us to Wednesday's lesson, Success in Mission. What is success in mission, our authors write? First paragraph, Wednesday. We might be tempted to think that it's many baptisms, big churches, rapid growth rates. We might feel that success consists of entering every tribe and people group on earth with the truth that we might speed it up by using radio, internet, and TV. All of this is good, it's important, but we must remember what Paul wrote. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. In other words, our responsibility is not the results we get, but faithfulness in our task. We give out literature. We give out a book here, a book there. Loan somebody a Steps to Christ, the Desire of Ages, a great controversy. We have a Bible study. We, we conduct a small group, maybe a lay evangelistic meeting. Or we conduct health classes, a nutrition series, a wellness series, a stress management. Or we get involved in family life. Or we minister through Sabbath school to teenagers. Whatever it is, we are reaching out and using the gifts that God has given us. If we are faithful, one day in a place called eternity, one day on streets called gold, one day in heaven, people will walk down those streets and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. See, our, our, our goal is not so much the end result as it is faithfulness to God. Now, the lesson on Wednesday lists a number of texts, it lists probably a good 10 texts. And in these texts, they're essentially saying the same thing. Second Corinthians 11.2 points out that God is a very jealous God. He wants us saved. Isaiah 30, verse 21, John 10, 27, John 16, 12, and 13, you see it in the middle of the page, page 108 in your quarterly Wednesday's lesson, shows that God is trying to reach us through his Holy Spirit. You remember Isaiah 30, verse 1 says, you'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. John 10, 27 talks about my sheep hear my voice. And John 16, verse 12 and 13, talk about the Spirit guiding us into all truth. God is a God of mission, and he is working through his Holy Spirit to lead men and women in, th in every country of the world, every language, every nation, every culture to himself. If they do not resist the leading of that Holy Spirit and do not reject that leading of the Holy Spirit, God will lead them to the place where they make a conscious choice to serve him. He's the light that lights every man and woman that comes into this world. But what keeps some people from the fullness of accepting God's truth? Well, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 11 says they received not the love of the truth. Hebrews chapter 3 says they had a heart of unbelief. And 1 John 1, 8 says the truth was not in them. In other words, if you love truth, Jesus will lead you to truth. But if you rebel against the truth he's led you to thus far, he will be limited in the amount of truth that he'll lead you to in the future. And so if we love truth, you see, following God's truth is not simply a matter of the mind, it's a matter of the heart as well. Because unless you love the truth, you will not discern or understand the truth when God reveals that truth to you. So what does that lead us to? It leads us to pray earnestly that, that our hearts will be open to the truth of God. 1 John 1 verse 9, Revelation 7 14, Revelation 19 8, Wednesday's lesson. If we confess our sins, he's going to forgive them. And Revelation 7 14 speaks about a great multitude. And it says they're clothed in fine linen, which are the righteous acts of the saints. So what do we get out of Wednesday's lesson, out of these four sequences of texts? The first sequence of texts says God's jealous. 
and the church is his bride. He loves his church. He's drawing it to himself. The second set of texts says that the Holy Spirit is convicting every heart to lead people to truth, to Jesus. Third set of text says the reason some people don't, are not led to truth is why? Because they don't love the truth, because they have a heart of unbelief. The truth is not in him. And the, third, and the fourth set of text says that if we confess, we will, uh, we will be part of that great multitude. If we confess our sins, we open our hearts to that truth. If we love the truth, we can be part of that great multitude and be led to follow Jesus, the Lamb, as one of those 144,000, wherever he goes. Now, the bottom paragraph under Wednesday's lesson says, disciples of Jesus are pure, remaining loyal to him as a pure bride would be to her betrothed. They follow Jesus as he leads them by the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. This includes leading us into missionary work for others. There's no deception in these disciples. They're not led astray by debilitating doubt, false teachings, or morality. And they do not feel morally superior to others. They recognize that they're imperfect, requiring God's cleansing grace and mercy. Understanding this, they're open to receiving correction and instruction from other believers. Success in mission depends or results in making this type of disciple. In other words, God wants to create within us a humble spirit in which we love his truth, desire his truth, and want to share his truth. Well, one day mission will be complete, won't it? Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 4, John looks up into heaven, says, I, John, saw the holy city descending from heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle as God is with men, and he shall be with them and be their God. God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more heartache, no more death. The former things are passed away. Revelation 21, 22 and to 22, 5 talks about this great holy city that's come down. Satan and his host will be destroyed and Jesus will reign forever and ever and ever and ever. Now is the time to invest in God's mission. Now is the time to be actively involved in winning the lost. There's going to come a day when probation closes that everybody who has made a final decision will have made it. The door has been shut. Why? Not because God's mercy has run out. Not because God's grace has run out. Not because God doesn't love anymore. The door of mercy is shut because every human being has already made their final irrevocable decision. And if the door of probation were left open, not one person would make another decision. God still loves, but God has done everything he could to reach people. If that is true, and it is, probation will shut one day. In heaven, will there be anybody to witness to? Well, we'll certainly give our testimony about the love and grace of Jesus, but there'll be no lost people in heaven that'll be saved by our testimony. So now is the time to reach out. Now is the time for mission. Now is the time to go to labor for Christ. As Friday's lesson puts it, in the third paragraph down, Ellen White, letter 390, 1907, she says, I long to see very many laborers at work for those who know not the evidences of our faith. Many have received great light through hearing the three angels' messages, and now they should do what? Proclaim these messages in all parts of the earth, of the world. I desire to do my part, she says, to open the way for others to carry the light of truth. May the Lord help us to put the armor on. The believers are to unite in the solemn work of giving the last note of warning to the world. This is the climax of our lessons on mission. But it's not the climax of mission. It's not the climax of our work. God is appealing to you. How have these lessons this quarter impacted your life personally? How have they touched you individually? Have you been motivated to get out of your comfort zone and to be a powerful witness for Jesus? Why not open your heart and pray that God will lead somebody into your life? Why not get involved in distributing literature, giving away a book, going to a Bible study, conducting a Bible study, getting involved in a small group? Why not tell Jesus right now that you want to be part of his mission. Let's pray. 
Father in heaven, we thank you that we can be part of your mission, that you're working to save the world. And the most wonderful work in the world is the work of redemption. Thank you, Lord, that you call us to be part of it. And we commit our lives to serving you. In Jesus' name, amen. Until next time, next quarter's lessons are going to be in another exciting quarter. Next quarter's lessons are in the Psalms. And we're going to be studying the Psalms. The Psalms are some of my, most, my favorite literature. Often my wife and I read the Psalms every morning. So stay with me. Next week, we go into a new quarter on the Psalms. God bless you.